Lucas runs Robo Creative. He's been a part of that company for a while now. But he's doing it a little bit different and trying to be a little bit more of an agency. And so I asked him to try to come um, talk a little bit about merchandising, how you started to work with some really big companies and be able to scale kind of similar to the, to the questions that you guys had today. So please give a round of applause. Lucas and Robo Creative. All right, all right. Um, one, thank you, Rick. There was a lot of amazing stuff in there um, that I will probably end up kind of touching on some of those, the ups and downs that we faced and um, just kind of a lot of the, uh, the same issues that seem to be kind of part of the industry trend right now. Um, some things that are just our perspective of being, you know, kind of some of the younger guns. Um, and where you know we're kind of passionate about taking the next steps of the industry and whether we're doing that right or wrong um, we don't really know but we're kind of still kind of moving with that so as Bruce said I'm Lucas um, Robo Creative is the company um, that my partner and I started roughly 13 years ago like everybody kind of in a basement um, and so we'll get into kind of the uh, the ins and outs of that so um, that would be me there on the left hopefully sipping a wonderful fine Jamaican rum. Um, that's my partner Joe on the right. <clears throat> so we met back in the day when I was 15 years old. Um, we came from the music industry, which is where a lot of this kind of talk on brand and why brand is so important, um, where we just kind of were doing that instinctually coming from the music industry. So <clears throat> a couple quick things. Um, a lot of I, everybody obviously is kind of from the industry, so I don't want to have this be too kind of corporate pitchy about the business. I want to get into the heart of it. So I'll kind of flip through rather quickly um, a lot of the overview just of the company. And if you have questions on that, we can talk on it. But there's a lot more meat kind of in the rest of it. But um, a couple main points in here um, that I want to point out. So part of our mission to be a leader in the branding and decorated apparel industry while delivering inspiration and innovation to every client. So specifically why I want to point that out is because um, it used to be kind of when I had earlier rendition of this, it was to be the leader in the branding and decorated apparel industry. But I think that that kind of concept for us is it, it doesn't really matter to us. We can You can want to be the best, you can want to be the biggest, but I think as we're starting to kind of <clears throat> move through the industry and realize where we're strong and also just what separates us is that it doesn't really matter to us. We just want to be really good at what we're doing and we want to be kind of part of the entire industry that is either pushing things forward, helping create the community, um, and just helping educate. So this is this sort of setting and this sort of situation is something that I'm absolutely, absolutely passionate about. I could talk for hours and hours about everything business-wise, but also everything kind of industry-wise, because I think hopefully I have a lot of things to share and hopefully a lot of things that, like Rick, we've done wrong or we've just learned from and trying to kind of like pivot and find a different angle to, to refine that. So um, <clears throat> as Bruce also said, you know, we're very determined at creating and maintaining a, a, a different model for what a print shop can be. And I will kind of get into this idea of what our idea of brand is for Robo Creative. But yes, we're a print shop, but we're so much of everything else that is out there. And I know that I think a lot of people in this industry, when you first start, the idea is that you want to jump into it and you just want to take everything that is out there. So if you didn't do embroidery, somebody asks you for embroidery, then maybe that's something that you're going to say, yes, that's what we do. And you figure out a way to scramble and source that and figure it out. I mean, I think the industry in general is extremely flexible and everybody at this point, you know, has a really good sense of being an entrepreneur and part of what that is is just figuring out how to make how to make stuff work and how to figure out a way to get it done and that's hopefully why we are where we all are at this point in the industry. <clears throat> so, quick background, uh, back to the glory days. Um, so on the left, this was the band that I was in um, in Chicago. That was our wonderful Mesa Boogie um, artist sponsorship. Um, Joe is on the right um, with his band, Colonel Stem. And so the reason that I bring this up is not to celebrate the glory days, but just because we were doing and we were so focused on branding without really understanding what that was even back then. We understood the concept of having a name, having a, um, you know, kind of a whole vibe to everything, having a way that the audience perceives you, having a way that your consumers perceive you, um, down to your logo, down to the nonsense studded belt that I chose to wear. Um, so, you know, that was just 
we the, the whole company started because like Rick, in a basement because we needed to print t-shirts. I needed to print t-shirts for a record release that we were doing, um, and that was just, that was it. It was convenient for us. We both had multiple, multiple art degrees from <clears throat> different colleges. We were resourceful. We were the business people in the, uh, the bands that we were working on, and so we just had that let's figure out a way to make it work mentality. So before we even got to the point of where we are now and kind of all the iterations of what that has become, we were already doing this and we had already adopted kind of the idea of how important the concept of branding is and the concept of brand to kind of keep pushing you forward. So <clears throat> fast forward to um, the early days of, I guess, the version of the what became Robo Creative. We started as a clothing company. That was Three Buddha Apparel. Um, we were doing just original designs for ourselves, just having fun with it. I mean, we were still printing band merch kind of for us and for a couple of small friends, but we had no concept of what it was in terms of trying to get across to new clients, trying to build a business, trying to ever get to the point of having one employee, let alone 40, 50 employees and kind of the nightmare that that becomes. So we started as Three Buddha Apparel, started trickling in with more and more clients, and we got to the point where we started to realize <clears throat> we were working with more and more Catholic institutions, um, churches, schools, high schools, and that was kind of an oh shit moment of, okay, well, we're working with all these institutions, and we don't know if they're gonna perceive this kind of weird, but Three Buddha Apparel, Catholic institution, is this gonna be weird? So it was kind of the first time that we stepped back and we realized that maybe we shouldn't go that route. We picked that because we thought that it was gonna be a cool kind of iconography. iconography. It was actually supposed to be 10 Buddhas originally, but when we were designing it, it was way too many Buddhas to have on there, so we, <laughs> <laughs> we settled on three at that point. So fast forward, we ended up you know, kind of just crank, cranking away in the basement um, and ultimately settled on Rowboat Creative. There was no bigger kind of philosophical picture behind the whole thing, except we wanted to find something that was kind of ambiguous. We wanted to find something that wouldn't be offensive to anybody. We didn't want to be Joe and Lucas's awesome t-shirts. We didn't want to be something that was too easily read and do too kind of stock because yes, we were printers. Yes, we were kind of the art kids, but we wanted to kind of have the ambiguity to be able to kind of just figure out where that lane was for us. So. Ultimately, we ended up settling on Robo Creative. I wish we still had all the list of all the other names that it was at that point, but um, so this is kind of the iteration of what it's become right now. We're kind of working through <clears throat> just some new updated branding, but um, we have the W in the, that is actually supposed to be the silhouette of a rowboat from Head On that we did 13 years ago that has been looked at as buck teeth or also boobs or a butt, so <laughs> we've worked through that. Um, <clears throat> so again, I'm going to kind of gloss over this really quickly just so it's not too pitchy, but um, screen printing, embroidery, sublimation, DTG, live branding activations, and fulfillment. We do a ton in the music industry um, that, that is also kind of branched out to a lot more in just marketing agencies. We really have a very wide spectrum of clientele, and so part of you know what I'll continue to get into and in figuring out what your brand is and you know what lane that is. And every step of the way, people have always kind of said that you know you got to pick one lane and you got to stick to that. Just commit to what you do best and really focus on that. And I think we agree on that, and I do agree with that. But I think that we really celebrate like that ambiguity. And I've had this conversation with so many people in the industry too that. I, we kind of love the fact that when people ask what Robo Creative is, they don't really know. And every year, you know, they're kind of confused because we're, we're kind of moving back and forth and we're kind of just conforming with the times, but not just jumping into everything that is completely trendy. So again, I don't know if that's right, but that's kind of our concept of what our brand is because we know that we are flexible. We have that let's get it done mentality. We figure out a way to do it no matter what. And so that's kind of what we've adopted <clears throat> as who we are as a company. Started 13 years ago in a basement. We've grown you know, considerably. We're now in Chicago. Logan Square is where our main facility is. 60,000 square feet. Um, started you know, in a basement with just Joe and I. Jumped into then a warehouse about three years after that. Ended up getting one employee, you know, turned into two employees, three employees. We were kind of, we started as just about a thousand square feet and then we started kind of tetrising out here and there. 
and you know made mistakes all along that because it was just very organic growth from the start again we had really no concept or idea we hadn't come from big shops so we were trying to figure it out as we went along and um, you know ultimately realized that we were set up inappropriately so finally when we got to the point of about 8,000 square feet at the last facility we realized that <clears throat> now is the time to do this and it was both an extremely exciting but also very scary point because you realize that we're here we have I think we had what 15 15 employees maybe at that time 8,000 square feet we had a lot of heavy hitter clients we were doing well but we were crammed it wasn't the way that we envisioned it it was dusty it was dirty it was dark it was kind of everything that Sorry if some of your shops that are, are like that, but that's just where we didn't want to be in the industry. We want to consistently be flipping everything kind of on its head. So <clears throat> fast forward three years ago at this point, moved into a new facility, um, got the chance to set up correctly the way that we wanted to do it. So we went from having um, four automatics at that point. We actually ended up dropping one of them that was an old Challenger one because it was a piece of shit. It was set up inappropriately and we realized that the efficiency that we had set up in the new facility was probably quadruple what it was. So <clears throat> that's where we are now. Um, we'll get into a little bit more of that. But um, we do, like I said, a lot, of, a lot of boutique brands. We do a lot of people that are on the high end of things. They want the quality, they want the flexibility, they want the ideation. So as Bruce kind of said, you know, we're not just a print shop. We can do all of that, we can do all of the you know, all the fulfillment. Every time that we explain it to somebody, it really kind of is in like a three-part situation where, you know, we say that if you want us, if you want to come in and you just want us to be a contract decorator, if we feel like that's a value add to us to partner with you, cool, we can do that all day. We can be quiet, we'll take your PO, we'll do what we need to do. On the other side of it, we have a lot of people that are coming in that really just want uh, to work with us more to help build that brand. So that's where we kind of get that, that agency vibe, which, you know, we don't really like that. We don't want the, you know, kind of the entitled agency that is out there, but it really kind of is that. So, you know, at any point, you're, you're all more than welcome to stop by. You know, I think you get a, a very quick sense of who we are, what our vibe is like when you step, when you step into the facility and kind of meet people from the team. So <clears throat> that's kind of my brief overview really quickly. But um, again, catch me after. I'm happy to answer all questions about that. But main point of being here, um, why brand is so important. And, you know, I think the first thing that when I started thinking about this, when Bruce and I were kind of talking back and forth about some ideas, <clears throat> Brand is everything that you are, regardless of whether you think that that's something that you need to focus on or not, you're already doing it. You're doing it down to your logo, you're doing it down to your color scheme, all of the orange that is orange and white that is here that Bruce and Printavo have decided that that's theirs, that's theirs. And so you're making some of these very conscious choices, but you're making some unconscious choices too along the lines. And part of that is figuring it out and kind of just evolving over time and figuring if that's where you want to be. So again, to go back to kind of the music days, we realized that, you know, that's what we were already doing. You're, you're starting to realize early on that the clothes that you're wearing on stage, how that's resonating with people, the way that you carry yourself, the type of reputation that is out there in the industry for you, the type of reputation that your customers have. Um, so those are just, you know, the very, very key things that, that I think if you don't have a brand or a concept of brand, you probably do, even if you don't think that you do. So it's, it's really important, I think, to re, be redefining those sorts of things and kind of focus in <clears throat> on what makes you you so that everybody knows that. Brand is, you know, pretty much everything. Like there's a subconscious and there's a conscious. There's very, like I said, the, the orange and the white, those are very tangible things. Um, but when you look at something like... Um, uh, what is it? Um, Tiffany's. So they have the, the blue box. Everybody knows that that comes in a blue box. It's iconic. You realize it immediately. They've made that conscious choice. You know, what they're also attaching with that is this whole vibe and this whole mentality of how romantic that is. And they're, they're trying to emotionally attach you to that so that you feel connected to it. You want that to be part of all those special moments, everything that is there. So for us, we, you know, the concept of being either just a print shop, a contract printer, or, or whatever you want to align yourselves with, we're trying to spin it differently. And I would say that that's exactly, you know, what I'm trying to get across is figure out what your clientele, figure out the people that you're engaging with, what makes them resonate with you. 
we work with a lot of the music industry, and so our people resonating with us because they knew us through the industry, because they know us just kind of from making that step into it, or is it just because the credibility and the word of mouth, people start to understand that, hey, these guys can get it done, they're good printers, they can crank it out, they also know the industry, they know everything in, inside and out about the logistics, about tour dates, about runs, and, and all sorts of kind of the, the ins and outs of that industry specifically. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I think that it's being able to focus on both what is that emotion that you're putting out there and also the emotion that you're trying to grab from those customers and consumers because some of the time you might be putting that vibe out there, those aren't the kind of people that you want to deal with. I mean, we've done, we've, we've shown at ASI Chicago for, I don't know, four, four years ago, five years ago, and we realized that wasn't our vibe. And you know, if, if some of you are ASI people, that's great. It, it just like for us to, to connect with that kind of market, it wasn't the type of partner that we wanted. We didn't want to kind of be going back and forth into, you know, nickel and diming things here and there. We knew that we wanted to be on the high level of things. So we wanted to make sure that the type of clientele that we have, we're not the most expensive out there. We're not the cheapest out there, but it's really kind of crafting that understanding and that emotion between partner and company to ensure that you guys are not just being run into the ground. So <clears throat> if you put yourself in that position, you're just gonna close your doors immediately. And um, I have some more to kind of talk on that in, <clears throat> in a little bit, but um, I pulled these rather quickly just to kind of touch on a couple of them. So on the, well, it would be, I guess, on the right side of them, um, top brands that are here. This is from Inc. Magazine, Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, AT&T. Um, on the other side, this comes from kind of the, the millennials top list of brands. Again, Apple, Nike, Samsung, Target, and Amazon. Main points of these, I don't really care too much about Samsung and, and AT&T, but I think the ones that stand out, I think to everybody that are kind of a no-brainer, <laughs> Apple and Nike. I mean, the concept of what they have, they've created an entire lifestyle that we are all so intertwined and stuck to that there's almost no way out. Apple, my entire livelihood and our entire shop is pretty much all Apple aside from all the embroidery gear because embroidery is stuck in 19... 42 but um, so but they've you know they've created this this concept in this field that you're emotionally attached to it every new Apple product that comes out you need that you need that because it's bigger it's better whatever the new technology is so you want to be the first one in line you got to keep going with that I mean as we get older and older I'm kind of caring less and less about that but um, but I think for Nike you know they watch a Nike ad I mean they will grab you immediately if you're not a runner if you're not an athlete they're trying to push you immediately into that field giving you the concept that you can do anything that you put your mind to I don't care if you're 400 pounds you put on a pair of Nikes and some very high priced athletic gear you might be able to be the next Olympic athlete so I think I, I, I just wanted to bring those up because those are very important things to me of why <clears throat> connecting with people emotionally and making that part of your brand is so important. Um, so six reasons branding is more important than ever. Um, brand defines the you in your business. So everything is so oversaturated these days. We all understand Instagram or we don't understand Instagram and social media. There's a million printers out there. There's a million embroiderers. There's a million people in the industry, period. So how do you separate yourself from everybody else? You could do paid ads, you could do all of that, you can pay an extremely high priced agency to do all of your branding and all of that, but almost to a certain extent, that doesn't really even matter. It's about finding what that voice is, connecting again with those people, and just continuing to kind of like reiterate those things over and over so that people, they do know who you are. They know what our vibe is. They know that when they walk in immediately, this is the type of clientele they're probably gonna work with. It's, it's an easy way for both of you to really kind of feel out the situation. So it's like every consumer, at least to us, is kind of, that's like, it's like a first date. You get one experience to basically feel out how this experience is gonna be or the date. And within, I have a fact somewhere on this, 50% um, of consumers consider becoming more loyal to a brand during the first purchase. So 
why that's important is because we still believe, and everybody kind of hopefully has that concept, you get one shot, especially in an industry that is oversaturated with everybody. So what is that first experience? What is that first email like? What is the tone that everybody gets from what it's like to work with these sorts of people? I have a friend who owned a, um, a skate shop, and I was there one time. We used to do a lot of printing for them. And I was there one day and it was, you know, kind of this very cool vibe. A lot of young kids, a lot of skaters just, you know, kind of hanging out. And the phone would ring kind of constantly and I was standing there and he would pick up the phone and every time, the, the name of the, the skate shop was Modest Skate Shop. Every time he picked up the skate shop, or skate shop, every time he picked up the phone, he answered the phone like, Modest. And to me, it was interesting because like he's already creating that vibe. Like in that skate world, you know, whether that's, they wanted to be kind of like the, the elitist cool guys that were out there, as opposed to answering the phone and saying, hi, Modest Skate Shop, how can we help you with all your skating opportunities and you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that wasn't what he wanted to do. So the concept of like your first impression, that first date, everything that you wanna do, whether you have to like overly butter someone up or not, that's fine. But I think it's, it's important on both sides of it for you to be feeling out, is this the type of person that you want? Do you want somebody who's calling up and saying, hey, I've checked around with 18 other print shops and 18 other facilities, they're gonna do it for seven cents. And your pricing is at 57 cents. Are you gonna take that just because you want to? And early on, sure, that was our mentality because yeah, we wanna take all the work that we can get. And part of it has been that learning curve of trying to figure out where do you wanna be? Is that gonna drive you in the ground, like Rick said? Is it is important to be there and know where your bottom line is and just know what you wanna deal with? Going through it for, 13 years at this point of, we don't really want to deal with that. We don't want to deal with the people that are just muscling you around because there's some other facility that is out there that's going to do, someone's always going to be doing it cheaper. But those people are probably coming to you because the people that they were getting it for cheaper screwed something up, the quality was shitty. So we're trying to kind of conceptually and, and not in a very aggressive way just nudge back and try to realize that maybe this isn't the best fit for us and for you at that point. It's not about being an asshole and saying they work too good for you, but it's about understanding that clientele and what, what, what that brand is for you and if that makes sense for you. So <clears throat> it defines the you. Um, brand signifies your intent. It puts it out there very quickly and explicitly what you are very quickly. Um, again, kind of the ambiguity of, of what we are as Robo Creative is a very conscious choice. It's not Robo Creative, awesome printers for the music industry. It's just Robo Creative. So some people don't know what that is. If they're coming over, if they want kind of the brand experience, if they want the live activation stuff and experiential, cool. That's kind of stuff that has been been kind of boiling and we've been working with for the last five years. But everything else, it kind of signifies you pretty immediately. <clears throat> Brand helps to outdo your competition. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to beat out any of your competitors, but what it's doing immediately is separating you. If any of you have ever been even just cruising for something as you're going to buy something, if you go to buy a shirt online, or, or I guess I shouldn't use a shirt as an example for everybody. Um, you're going to buy shoes online. If you go and it's just some shitty website, there's terrible branding, it looks suspect, you don't know if they're gonna steal your credit card, you're probably gonna move on. So if you get to it, there's everything looks legit. This is in line with kind of how you are vibe wise, emotionally, you're attached to it. You're probably gonna buy. And if you have a great experience from that, you're probably gonna keep buying. And if you're not even continually buying from them, you're going to spread that word. So for us, for 13 years now, <clears throat> even though it feels like every single year we say the same thing, that it now feels like the first year in real business to us. For 13 years, everything has been organic. I mean, for only the last, I wanna say, like six months to a year, have we really started to put some more pointed focus on working with sales a little bit more, trying to get more aggressive, because we've gotten to the point of, you know, being a multi-million dollar company and we haven't really done too much. It's all been organic because it's just come in through word of mouth because people resonate with the brand. And again, whether that's because we've been doing a good job of that or if that's just because of the organic growth, hopefully we're doing something right. So it doesn't mean that we're beating out you know, competition here and there. We don't really, we're very conscious of competition, but it doesn't really matter in the end of the day. That back to the mission, we're not just trying to be the best of the best and the biggest just so that we can say that because 
that can really mean absolutely nothing. You could be a $10 billion company and you spend $9.9 .9 billion and what is the point of that just for you to kind of gloat? So. <clears throat> Um, quickly, and we'll kind of move on from this, but um, you know, brand builds trust. That's kind of a no-brainer. Um, if your consumers are committed to you, they're obviously gonna trust you. If they have a great experience, they're gonna continue coming back and spreading the word. Opens up new channels of revenue. Kind of a no-brainer as well. Um, you know, if, if you have organic growth and you're having other kind of clientele, which is what has happened to us, we've gotten to the point when we've been able to work with a lot of the heavy hitters, Nikes and Adidas and all that sort of stuff. And that kind of just organically grew from, one, them first coming to us needing just production. They needed a lot of quantity, they needed to print it well, and they needed to print it quick. Cool, we can do that all day long. Then they started to realize our flexibility. They realized that we could help on the experiential side. They realized that we had ideation capabilities, not because we're the hard sell guys and we're trying to pitch every single step of the way on everything that we can do. We don't. We kind of wave it in and say, look, here's what we can do. If you need us, we're here. So. It just continues to really kind of fan out and you're realizing who those who those clients are that you want because they're embracing your brand and kind of ideology <clears throat> Branding harnesses the power of emotions. Um, we kind of talked about a lot of that so <clears throat> to touch on these real quick so the art kids with business minds this was a way early on um, Article I think in wearables that we had not that wearables, um, but this was special to us because this was kind of our concept of what our brand was. We were art kids, we did have business minds. So we realized we're really quickly, we're kind of just casting out a net to everybody else that maybe resonates with that. It's not the guys that are sitting there, you know, in the, in the corporate attire and saying, come to us because, you know, we can show you all of these inside and out numbers of why our promotional products are gonna help build your brand. We didn't wanna go after that. So, that was kind of a really important um, message for us to be out there, one, to the industry and just to potential clientele as well. Um, we've done tons with wearables, we've done tons with counselor. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of part of our passion too, of just helping educate where we can, you know, keep some exposure out there for us, but also just letting people kind of know where we are. So that wearables cover um, ended up turning to be a complete nightmare because they asked us to do this crazy gradient print that went across both the whole full front and then the sleeves. We probably did, I don't know, 25 different versions of this entire thing, trying to put it on different people, make sure that it aligned perfectly, and then however many days into it, we realized that it was just for a photo shoot, and so the model could just shift their weight to make sure that it aligned. So kind of lesson learned with that one after that. <coughs> um, so in the last couple years, you know, we, we set a goal, you know, kind of just personally and just as a company to, to get recognized as part of the Inc. 5000. Great, great milestone, but also opens up a whole can of worms. And so, you know, I kind of want to start to touch on some of the downsides of, of one, the growth that has happened and just, if any of this too, like just so I'm not just talking to everybody too, like I prefer when any of this is conversational, so feel free to jump in at any point. Um, um, Inc. 5000, um, and then also Inner City 100. So Inner City 100 um, is kind of similar concept to uh, to Inc. 5000 about just you know extreme growth at a certain point, and also just continued growth. And so why those were amazing milestones for us was because of just the personal benchmark for those. But like I said, it opened up the can of worms. So we've postured ourselves now as this brand we have this elite clientele you know we we're not out there telling our employees and also consumers that we are the best it doesn't really matter to us but people are starting to associate us with a specific vision in a specific re specific re or excuse me specific vision and what started happening was as these sort of credentials and these milestones started coming in was the culture that we've created based on our our brand was that we came from that are kids with business minds. So we took on all of the employees, you know, that wanted to be here because these are the cool guys. They have a cool atmosphere. They work with awesome people. They have really cool clientele. And so we found ourselves kind of in that middle, middle ground of trying to figure out as a brand, great, we have that message. But internally, what's happening is that people are siding more towards the art kids. So they want to just treat it like we're the art kids. They want to come in late. They don't want to work as hard. But the business side of it, where we start cracking the whip and saying, that's fine, we can have this lax mentality, but 
get your shit done. We need people that are, are working hard, they're diligent. Yes, they believe in the brand, they believe in the vision, but we're here to do work. So all of these sorts of things started to kind of nudge in two different ways. So when like Inc. 5000 came in because you had to be at a certain revenue to you know even be there, thought it was a great idea the first time, now it doesn't seem like a great idea because people now see, oh great, you're making millions of dollars. What's the first assumption that every employee makes you're putting millions of dollars in your pocket. So <clears throat> very quickly, we saw kind of this new like mode of employee mentality that we have started to kind of like start to flush out because it doesn't, it becomes blood in the water and it, it, it almost just starts to infect every single thing. So Joe had a really interesting experience with one of our employees. There was 30,000 pieces for um, the Columbus uh, hockey team um, that were sitting there. And he came up to her and he was like, what are, you, what are you doing? And she was like, I'm just trying to like take all this in. He's like, what are you trying to take in? And he goes, let me ask you something. How much money do you think this all costs? And she goes, well, what do you mean? Like how much money the company makes per shirt? And he said, yeah. So she stood there for a second and said, I don't know, $10, $20 a shirt? So he was like, he, he, at that point, you mean to think that this is $600,000 that the company just made here in the last three days? And she's like, yeah, well, because they, they're sold for $30 in retail, right? So <clears throat> there, and you know, whether that's our fault of kind of maintaining the transparency of financials, I've done, you know, kind of tons of workshops on that. And, you know, there's great ideas about, um, you know, kind of open book management and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, that's something where we had some issues of trying to trying to maintain what the brand was and maintain also, you know, what reality is too. <clears throat> so part of our mentality of kind of brand is being supportive of a lot of the local artists that we work with, um, any art. Actually, sorry, a lot of those paintings, um, Edward, who used to work for TNJ, those were actually one of his, or a lot of his, um, that he did with Emulsion, different screen printing inks. So, you know, kind of just part of our culture and part of our brand is making sure that we're <clears throat> supporting everybody that's out there and kind of embodying that message. So um, this is something that we ran um, that a lot of people really liked. Um, it was part of getting to know all the employees a little bit more, you know, having having more more eyes on what everybody does inside and outside of work. It's great they all come to work, but you know, we have a very talented staff, so we really wanted to kind of celebrate that. This was important you know, for our concept of brand, just so that people see that we don't just have jobbers. I mean, there are people there that are for a job, but helping us to get across to them that we care about them inside and outside of the company. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I would recommend, you know, if this is part of your vibe and something that you want to do, then absolutely, you know, kind of go with that. <clears throat> Live branding activation is a lot of stuff that we've done um, to start building you know, more brands. Um, so a lot of the heavy hitters that have come to us, like I said, how we've gotten to that point to start working with them and how we kind of elevate their brands has been with a lot of the live branding stuff. I know that um, there's gonna be a talk on this so I won't get too much into that, but um, it's been huge. Experiential um, marketing has been absolutely, you know, kind of topping the charts for the last four or five years. So we've definitely tapped into that and we're kind of just rolled into that really organically. So that's pretty much it. I mean, the concept for us, you know, of why we've gotten to where we are in terms of building brands, again, is just because it happens organically. All of the ideation and just really kind of creating that concept of what your brand is and what is important to you. Um, is what has gotten us to the point of, you know, kind of where we are. So a lot of the heavy hitters that are, that are out there, um, they've come to us because they've seen the brand, they understand kind of the concept, they like the vibe, and, and part of that is just us continuing to like organically work with them and, and feel it out, figure out what is the best lane, <clears throat> figure out where we're kind of headed in the industry. And, you know, kind of as, as Rick said again, that you know, making a conscious decision just to say, I'm going to be the biggest company that's out there. It really doesn't mean anything. There's always gonna be somebody that has another auto. There's going to be another bigger shop somewhere else. Being the best, that's amazing too. But at the same time, just to walk around telling people that you're the best doesn't really mean anything because there's probably gonna be somebody else that is, you know, in a, in a basement that is probably printing better than any of us can be doing and they don't really care. It's about their passion and that's what their brand is to them. So, 
you know, we're, as Robo Creative, we're still kind of conceptualizing that and figuring that out as time grows because, you know, we've gotten to the point, 40 employees, and we've gone through all of those woes of wanting to scale it back. If Joe and I could go back into the basement, probably absolutely would. Um, best time in the world, IRS doesn't know about you, um, no employees. <laughs> And you know that was it, it's been a very interesting road to get to this point of like building the brand organically trying to figure out where we are and and you know five years ago if you would have asked me you know would would we what would we want to be doing keep growing keep growing keep growing keep growing last two years it's kind of been the opposite let's not focus just on the overall growth of saying great we got to X amount of revenue we have 47 million employees it doesn't matter we're so focused on the internals right now because not only just for people's sake, but also for the sake of what that means for us as people. If we can't, we built the company for 13 years now, and if we're still in the fire running it around the clock because we haven't created the right internals, it looks great on the outside as a facade, that kind of means nothing. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I urge you as much as you can to really focus on what brand means to you. You can do all your research, you can look at all the, all the, you know, analytics and case studies and all of that stuff, but it kind of means nothing. Until you realize what you're passionate about, if that's just being the best simulated process printer, go out and do that and be embody that and make sure that all of your branding kind of resonates with that so that you're, you're generating that emotional attachment to, you know, your customers or clients or whoever you want to get across to. Or if you don't want anybody to talk to you, then you put up that facade as your brand too. But um, so hopefully that, you know, kind of really, um, got across at least, you know, what we're passionate about, what our concept of brand is. Again, it's ever-changing, so, you know, I'm always happy to answer questions about what has worked for us, what has not worked, um, and kind of open it up to anybody else that, that has any questions. Yeah? So what was the rest of the conversation with the employee? Um, which one? The one about the uh, 30,000. Oh. <laughs> Um, no, we explained that that was contract hot market printing and we were probably getting raked over the coals for 25 cents a print. So um, that's like the first case of like, you know, they all, they all know that, but they just, I think every time we have those conversations, they all think that it's bullshit anyway. We could say that in a million times that we're making 10 cents a print here and we're probably losing money by the time that we get hit with all the overtime and in cost anyway, but they just see it as, yeah, right, you guys are making millions of dollars. And if that was the case, then why are we there all of the time? <laughs> so are you actively being an open book management company and that's just, you're failing to get your point across? We're not. So <clears throat> we haven't ever like fully launched it um, because I've heard, you know, kind of back and forth stories. I've had people who have had great success with it. I mean, Zingerman all day long, but I've had some that have the same conversation that are like, people don't believe it no matter what. So I don't know, it just, it's not something that we've fully ever launched and I feel like there's, there's good sides to it and there's also bad sides and there's always still gonna be kind of the discrepancy and ambiguity whether employees fully believe that you're telling them all the numbers or you know, kind of the ins and outs. Yep. So we're big in our small town, but how do you get the heavy hitters when you're not in a big city or you know what I mean? Like, how do you get HBO or Amazon or Grow when you're just small? I don't, I mean, without it being just that, the race to the bottom, I mean, that's like the number one answer. So we've seen, you know, a lot of competitors that are just in that race all day long and it becomes terrifying. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that our key to success has just been that organic growth and, and honestly making sure that Everything that we say that we're going to do, we obviously do. You know, that's kind of business 101. If you say the product's gonna be there, product's there. So, you know, giving them the best experience that you can, hopefully that that's gonna to continue to like organically, word of mouth, someone's gonna say you got that. Um, I mean, a lot of it too is just, you know, networking and connections and you can't, you can teach, you can have the best sales team that is out there, but you know, if that's not your vibe to be picking up the phone and cold calling, you know, that's, that's part of your brand. As soon as someone gets a phone call and it's like, Hey, I'm calling from Robo Creative. I have a manager special today. You know, like, do you want those calls? I don't want those calls. So, I don't know. I, I if I had a perfect answer to that, you know, we might be working with all of them. So, I, I just think organic growth, and you know, just keep doing what you're doing, and hopefully, like, it starts to, to roll in. So when you switched from, or when you went from Creative to Robo, were you still? <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, no. I mean, we were still in the. It was literally within like the first, I want to say, year. So we still had like we wanted to keep passionately focusing on like our own clothing line because still, 13 years later, we realize every single day we have an entire factory at our fingertips, and yet we're not doing this, and we're producing for people who are selling to retail for nine million percent margin. So. I don't know. Um, the uh, my time is up. <laughs> Sorry, you moved. Um, so, to quick answer, no. Um, I mean, it was kind of just like in the middle of everything, and we just realized. Yeah, because those clients they didn't even really care what was going on anyway. It was a lot of band friends, and we were like, fine, we're calling ourselves this, and they were like, cool, just make sure we get our stuff. <laughs> but um, thank you guys so much, um, Bruce Pitavo. Really appreciate it. I'll be around. Thank you.